segment, though. Um, today, we're going to start our series in 1 John. Um, assurance is something that, um, and the, the sermon series is, uh, I, I know it's printed uh, knowing you, it should be knowing God, um, although you could imply that you would mean God, so um, I guess ultimately we could get to the same point here, but the, the song was knowing you, uh, the sermon is knowing God. Um, assurance is, is something that I, I think all of us would like to have in our faith walk, um, a matter of certainty, um, a matter of freedom from doubt. And when we're talking about our faith, it's very easy for us to um, wonder about that. Um, how, how, I think all of us at least wrestle with that one way or the other at some point or another. You know, what's my assurance? Do I have assurance of, of eternal salvation or, or not? Or is it just kind of a, a hope more than anything? Um, and there are always all kinds of different ideas of what people think maybe of something or the interpretation of God's word. And sometimes you might even hear somebody say one thing and then go somewhere else and hear something totally different. That's exactly the opposite of what you just heard. So then it's more of what, well, what's the truth? What's really right? It's confusing. It, sometimes you even see the same people do something totally different, right? They say one thing, preach one thing, and all of a sudden then they turn and do something totally different. Confusing. How do we know? This is especially an important issue considering that this has eternal consequences. It makes you put this more as a priority, a higher priority on the issue. Um, this letter is exactly that. This letter is giving us what is the assurance of our faith. John is writing to a group of people that are battling deception, that are battling darkness, that are battling confusion, and they don't know what the truth is. Um, this letter goes through, and John ends up helping us to understand how do we know that we really, truly are God's children? How do we know that we are in, his, in what he demands for his people? How do we know that we are in uh, his blessings. Um, it's a wonderful letter. Um, it's the same writer as the book of John, uh, the gospel of John, the fourth gospel. Um, also, he wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. He is one of the 12 apostles, the one that is written as the one that Jesus loved. I don't think Jesus didn't love the other ones and only John was the one that he was, was loved, but he clearly did have a very close relationship to, to Jesus, I think is what we should gather from that. Um, the book of John, the gospel, was written sometime around 70 AD. Not too long after the destruction of Jerusalem in 67 AD. And John ended up, it's said, to have left, this is extra biblical, outside the Bible, but that he left Jerusalem sometime right around that time and then migrated over to Ephesus. And this is the area that he spent really most of the rest of his life in, um, kind of being an influence on this whole area. So seeing that he was also the uh, disciple that took care of Jesus' mother, Mary, um, if she was still alive during this time, then she would have also been uh, with him in this time and most likely uh, died in that area as well. Um, but this is also where the letters of Revelation are all around. Um, Patmos, the island of Patmos, is the island that he was uh, exiled to and where he wrote the book of Revelation as well. You have Greece over here. This is Turkey. So this is the area. It's said that also that the book of John, the gospel of John, was written in Ephesus or in that area. Our book, 1 John, was written sometime right around 90 A.D., and the book of Revelation was written around 95 A.D. We'll see that it's really a lot of the same language, same images are used, which is great because those are very deep um, and insightful. It was most likely a circular letter, a letter meaning that because it didn't have any kind of a greeting to it, 
like most of the letters in the New Testament, it was something that was given for many churches around the area there, that it would kind of be more of a, a circulating letter, a letter for them to read and then pass on to another church and another church and another church. So there was an issue that, many issues that they were dealing with, and this letter was to help them deal with all of these issues that are going on in that area. The difficulties was is that there was a group of people that split away from the teachings that the apostles had been given and they were causing people to doubt their faith, to doubt who Jesus was and what it meant to be a Christian. So John was writing to give assurance in regards to a true faith. He was battling against deception and I think we see that throughout the whole New Testament. That's what all the letters are doing is that they are battling the darkness. They are battling deception. They are battling in the fact of how do we live out the Christian life in a world that has fallen, in a world of sin, in a world of corruption. How do we deal with this? How do we wrestle with living as a Christian? And that's exactly what we are seeing here. So our section is uh, today is the preface of the letter. It's um, three sections that we're going to look at. It states John's credibility and his objective for the letter. So the object is revealed, number one. The two is how it is revealed, the object. And then the purpose of the letter is established. So our first section, the word of life. Those eyes can look right through you, can't they? Yeah. If you didn't guess who that was, that's Jesus, okay? <laughs> I shouldn't assume, I guess. So, our passage. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. In the beginning... Is, uh, here is the first of four relative clauses that you see, and I've underlined each of them. And these each modify what the word of life is. The word of life is Jesus Christ. Word in Greek is logos. I'm sure that uh, many of you are probably familiar with that, but logos is, is the Greek word for that. Um, and in Greek, in, in Greece, um, the word, a lot of times, even was inferred as the creator. It was wisdom itself. The word spoke. Things were created. And that really also comes right out of the Bible as well. You see that in Genesis, that God spoke and things were created. Things lived. They had breath in them. Also, you see, uh, in wisdom literature, it's really the same thing. In Proverbs uh, one through nine is dedicated specifically to wisdom itself. In fact, you even see it personified in that area there. It's, it shows it as being something that lives, something that is actually a being, that is a light, an illumination to the path of life. We've talked about the way before, right? The way is actually what the first Christians were called. They were called the people of the way. Now that's from the Old Testament. The way is wisdom in Proverbs. It was called the way of God, the way of righteousness. The other path and whatever your path was that you walked on showed the place that you were headed towards, what your ultimate destination was. If you were on the road to Jerusalem, then you were walking, that's what everything, every step you were taking was going to get you to Jerusalem. If you were walking somewhere else, then that the steps that you're taking are going to get you there. And that's exactly what it's talking about. So the way to righteousness is the way to God. The way of wickedness is the way against God. And those are really the two paths that are illuminated in Proverbs. This is absolutely what John is talking about here. And we see the same exact thing when he's talking about it in his own gospel in the book of John. He starts off the gospel this way by saying in the first five verses, he says, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. All things were created from him and through him. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. He absolutely is referring to Jesus here and also in 1 John as the word of life, the creator that was with God in the beginning. Not only was he with him, but he is God also at the same point. That's pretty deep. You can contemplate on that one for a long time. But he's referring to the same thing here. There's no doubt about it. He's referring to Christ. He who is in the beginning. He, the creator of all. Wisdom of all. The path to life. And the fact that he also refers to him as the word of life only confirms that. Also, you see the same thing in the book of Ezekiel. In 37, we've talked about this before in the Valley of Dry Bones, where God speaks to these dry bones and he says, can these bones live? And the prophet says, only you know. And he instructs the prophet, speak to these bones the word that I give you. And I say to these bones, live, and you will live. And my spirit will come into them and give them life. And he says so, and it happens. They live. Heard, seen, looked upon, touched the word of life, all is showing a first hand contact with Jesus. Eyewitness, very credible. All John is going to say here is straight from the source of God himself, is what he's saying. It's an expression of fellowship, which he has with God the Creator. Now, that's a pretty amazing and incredible thought. Three of people's senses are expressed here, hearing, sight, and touch. Hearing, we had just learned in the Exodus, right? They heard God's word. He pulled them out of Egypt, and he gave them his word. They heard him actually speak from the mountain, even. They heard God's word, and they had God's word. It was revealed to him. But he heard it, he's saying, and he also saw it. Now, Israel saw God to a certain degree with the Shekinah glory, like we had talked about last week, that came over the tent, the tabernacle, right? The glory of God, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. It was there. So they saw him, but it was a limited version of his glory. Moses couldn't even see the face of God, remember? His hand, God's hand came over him to cover him as he went by. He could see the backside. He could see a limited expression of God's glory. But in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it says this, that God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, Again, saying this is the God of creation, the God of the beginning, the God who spoke and things lived. Let light shine out of the darkness has shone in our hearts, so has illuminated in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What he's saying here is that what Moses could not do, he could not see the face of God we are able to do by seeing Christ. We see the very face of God in Jesus Christ. Very powerful. They had direct contact, the apostles, John included here, with God. Not just that they heard about it or not even seen him at a distance like they did in Israel with the tabernacle. It's establishing his authority. He touched it. That's something totally different from the Old Testament. Nobody ever touched God. They could see him, they could hear him, see him somewhat. But he's saying, I've seen the face of God, I've heard him speak to me, and I've even touched him. That's totally different. And what he's basically doing is he's establishing his authority in opposition to those that are saying what they think that God wants them to know, 
but they have never even seen God. They've never heard him. They've never touched him. They don't have that kind of fellowship that John has had. Hearing, seeing, and feeling are all part of the gospel. It's part of the word of life. In fact, if you even say fellowship itself is the whole point of the gospel, the good news is that God has brought in a whole new fellowship than ever before. That's part of the whole good news of the matter. The genitive form of, of life, it defends what word the word is. The word is life. The word of life itself, it holds life within it. It is life-giving. That's what Christ is. And we see that also in John's book where he says the light of life, the bread of life, living water or water of life flowing from the throne of God in the book of Revelation in uh, chapter 22. See, following the word absolutely will bring a very real relationship. This is what I'm getting at. The relationship is not just intellectual. It's also relational. In fact, that's the whole point of the New Testament is that it's not just knowing about God. It's knowing him personally, intimately, walking with him. Who better <clears throat> as an authority on someone else <clears throat> than one who knows that other person personally? And time is the important part of that, right? The more time that is spent with a person, then we know them more. If we want to tell somebody about someone else, we tell them about the experiences that we've had with them, right? You need to meet this person. They're so great, you know? Tell me about this story and this story and what that happened over here and stuff. And you got you to gotta meet them. They're great. <clears throat> I myself knew God intellectually pretty much as long as I can remember. I don't think I've ever known a time in my life that I didn't know about God. I don't remember any time saying, I don't even know who this God is. I can always just remember saying, well, Jesus, he's God, you know, and he died for me on the cross. And I, I knew all this stuff intellectually, but I didn't know him. I heard people talking about, but you need to have a personal relationship with Christ. I was like, whatever. <laughs> he's, he's not even here. How am I supposed to have a relationship with him? So I lived worldly. I didn't really follow him. I knew of him. I came to church. I even served some places and stuff. I called myself a Christian, but I didn't have any relationship with him. It was until I was 33 before he finally showed me that there's a whole other element of this Christianity that I didn't even know about. <clears throat> and as far as I'm concerned, it's the most powerful element of it. It's not the only part of it. Both need to be there, the intellectual and also the ex experiential. Both. Because as soon as he did show me that, I redirected my entire life and went from business to being a pastor now. Amen. Amen is right. And I would not change that for the world, but that doesn't happen unless something pretty big happened. Something pretty important. Imagine this. I loved what I did. I really loved it, and I was really good at it too. How does that happen? Something really powerful must have really hit me, slapped me upside the head, and it did. I know a, a doctor who just got back from Israel, and uh, he's known God, I think, most of his life as well. Has struggled with a relationship aspect. He absolutely considers himself to be a scientist, you know, so a person that requires... Uh, um, proof and uh, the whole element of, of testing theories and proving things and having you know something that can validate this, challenge it also at the same point. Um, on this trip, he came back, he told me, he said, I actually heard God speak to me twice. Now I just got a big smile on my face. I'm like, please tell me more. And I know it was hard for him to accept it because 
intellectually didn't make any sense. And he couldn't prove it. But he knew it was definitely there. And if anybody ever told him that wasn't real, it was just like a figment of your imagination, he would have said, you are nuts. I know exactly what happened. And it almost, it did. It crippled him almost to his knees. It got him to the point of emotional and, and getting, of, of sobbing, just like, you know, whole body kind of, like, kind of thing. Um, that's God. That is God. He is very real. And that's the kind of relationship that he expects for all of us to have. The Pharisees battled with this. That was the problem. These are people that knew God better than anybody Better than any, I would even argue, most of them knew God's word better than most pastors and theologians even today. They knew, they could tell you what form of a word, how many times it was used in the whole Bible. That's used five times, or that one's the only time it's ever used and stuff in that particular area there. That's ridiculous. And when they were children, they memorized the whole, the whole, um, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. By the time they were like, 10 or something like that. I could be off, but it's right in that area there. Memorize the whole thing. That's a lot. That's a lot. We just went through Exodus. That's all. But they didn't know God. They knew his word, but they didn't know God. And that's what Jesus challenges when he comes. He's telling them, he says, you know all of God's word, but you don't know me. If you knew God, you would know me because I'm from God. And ultimately, he is saying to them, I am God. And if you would have known who God is, you would have recognized who I am. Because I'm exactly like him. You know all about his word, but have no relationship with him. That is important for us to grasp. Every one of us, even and in, in, if anybody in here is saying, I've been a Christian, that's me, I've been a Christian my whole life and I know of God and, I, and I've served and I've gone to church and I've done all these things but I've never really had a relationship with him. I'm here to tell you, you are missing out on all of the good stuff. That's where the good stuff is. That's where the life is. Please talk to me afterwards if that's the case. I beg you. Um, that, that's it. That, I mean, that, that's huge, huge. Um, and everybody has access to that. That's not just like some people, well, some people get that and I just am not one of those people. Wrong. Every believer in Christ is meant to have that relationship. A very powerful, strong relationship where you know that God is with you every day. There might be times that are a little bit dark, but overall... He's meant to be walking with us and us to know it. And that's part of what, we're, what you'll see John is getting at, and that's also what this whole letter is all about also. All right. So, do we know the word of life? Not just intellectually, do we have a relationship with him? Do we walk with him? Is he alive and living in us? It's hard to understand that which you don't experience. It's easy for to hear about it and be like, well, I can understand what that must be like. But unless you experience it, how do you really know him? Unless you have that living in you. John touched him. Had that firsthand experience. And that's what he's given us also through his spirit. All right. Two, the life was made manifest. This is the how. How was he revealed? How or how uh, did he have that? The hearing, touching, seeing, and so forth. So the life was made manifest. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. This section is what explains the first section. This is in parentheses. It explains or reveals how he was revealed. Or I should say, how they were able to know him. He was revealed to them, exposed publicly, made known, is what manifest is, is basically saying. And remember from John 17, 3, that Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you. 
to be made known that God was made manifest so that we would know him. And that is eternal life of knowing God. And then he says, the Father both and the Son. This would not be possible to see or to experience unless the one who is eternally with the Father, unless God wants to be made known. He has taken the initiative to deliberately manifest himself. We are allowed to see only what God has chosen to make known, even if that includes him. God wants to be known. He wants to live with us, live in us. The whole presence was the issue of the second part of the Exodus, and we're seeing that same thing is here in the New Testament. The issue is presence, God being with us. It's just in a whole new way. If you look at the incarnation of the cross, of Christ becoming a human, think of that. That's not a pleasant experience, I'm sure. I'm not God, but just think about it. I mean, he's God. He's got things pretty good in heaven, I'm sure. Then he becomes a child that's totally dependent on everyone else. Has to be protected by God, by the angels, by humans, and so forth, and live in corruption and sin and, and hunger and, and loss. He lived in the poorest family that there was. The sacrifice that was done for him after he was born was for the poorest of the poor. He was broke, beyond broke. He was poor. And then look at the cross. If anybody ever says, sometimes I wonder if God really understands my pain or if he understands that I'm hurting or if he understands that, that I, what I'm going through. Just think what he went through to become a human, live for 33-ish years, and then die the way that he died. And he didn't deserve any of it. That's a long way to go from being God to dying as a criminal. Horribly long, enduring pain. He wants to be revealed. And he understands the importance of his presence also. It's so important that he's willing to go to that distance. That should get our attention. If it's that important for him, it should be that important for us to make sure that we are paying attention to this. He's saying, I love you this much. This is this important. I didn't send somebody else to do it. I did it myself. The son of God. And this absolutely goes in line with the name Yahweh that we talked about in the Exodus, right? What does that mean? It means he who lives. He who lives has life in him. He's not like the God of money or the God of, of a job or the God of, of whatever it is. All those things are important and we need them. But not to be our God. Our God is something different. God is God. And if we don't think that he is a really, a truly a God that lives, then we don't trust his word when he says, I will never leave you. I will be with you. I will empower you. I will give you my spirit. All of these things, if we really don't believe it, then we really have no faith in it. I know it says it, but he's not going to do that. You need to be careful of that. That's what he's saying here. It just shows that I am the God that lives. We often expect God to listen to us when we have not listened to him. His word, it is true. It's very true. I hear, unfortunately, more times than I'd like to hear. I'd be a rich person if I got a penny even every time I heard this, um, where people, they are going through such pain and they are just crushed. And it's hard for me to sit and watch, and, and I'm glad that they've come to me and talked to me, but it's hard to watch them going through their pain and say this, to say, Derek, I pray all the time. And I'm glad that they pray all the time. But is that it? Is that all that you're doing? God asks for so much more. What he wants is your heart. He wants all of you. He wants you, if, if 
Sometimes pain is sometimes is him saying, come back to me. Your heart is not mine anymore. You've given it to other things. Come back to me. Give me all of your heart and I will bless you. And he says, I will reveal myself to those that do this. I will bless you. I will walk with you. That's what's first. That's what's key. First, turn your heart fully to God. Then prayer means something. And I know you're not going to be perfect. None of us are. That's not what he's looking for. He wants your heart, though. When your heart is his, you will go wherever he tells you to go, do whatever he tells you to do. You will want to learn his word because that's where life is. You want to hear it. You want to know about it. And if you're not understanding, you're like, please, God, you start praying for that. Please, God, give me the spirit to understand your word better or have more of, a, of an understanding or even a craving or a passion for it. And you do. He gives it to you. He says, seek and you will find me. Ask and you'll receive. It's like he says in the parable. Who of us, it's Mother's Day, what mother that loves her child when their child asks for something would not give them if it's good for them, right? right? Who wouldn't? And he says, you who are sinners, you give your children good things. What do you think God is going to do? You think God is going to give them a, a stone or a scorpion when they ask for a fish or bread? Of course not. He's going to give them the things that they ask for. But he says, turn your heart to me. Seek the kingdom of God first. Then all of what you need will be given to you. All of it. Might not be what you want, but it is what you need. And I guarantee you it will give you life. A lot of it. You'll realize, we realize that there's no better place to be. Those who categorize the incarnation of Christ, Christ becoming a human as a myth, in my opinion, are simply those that have never experienced him. All of us can read about it, and you can go one way or the other and be like, and there are, I think there's plenty of proof for God that, that Christ existed, Christ was crucified, all of that, that he lived, and that legitimately there were tons of witnesses, that he rose from the dead. All of that stuff, I think, apologetically, will prove that, that he's very much was alive and, and died at the cross and was risen again. But either way, someone could argue with you, and you could go one way or the other. When you experience that Christ is there, no one can take that from you. No one. I can tell you all you want. Christ's not real or God's not real. And you feel like, you tell me whatever you want. But I know better. I know a lot better. This is what John is, is working towards. John has seen the manifestation and he testifies to it. Proclamation to the eternal life manifested. The revelation to a few were given for the benefit of many. But he's got to proclaim it give testimony to what it was that he experienced, that he saw, that he was part of. Manifestation with John becomes the proclamation to you and I. To testify is to be a witness for something that experienced truth. That's personal. To proclaim something is a commission given to preach the gospel. Authority is given. We get that through his word through the teaching, through following him. That's how John got to this point, is by submitting, by giving Christ his heart. He followed him and he learned from him. And he became, the life came into him, where Peter says to him, remember Jesus says to, to the disciples after all these people leave when he's telling them this tough teaching about how they got to eat his flesh and drink his blood if they want life and stuff. And, and they're like, ooh, that's, that's really rough to accept. I, I don't know if I know how to, how to get that. And a lot of them leave, right? A lot of people leave them. And he turns to his disciples. He says, do you want to go too? And Peter says, where are we going to go? You, you hold eternal life. You are the word, hold eternal life in the palm of your hand. You have the word of eternal life. Where would we go? We're not going anywhere. That's where John is at, and that's also what, what Christ calls us to. He says, follow me, and I'll teach you. I'll give you what you need, but I want your heart. I want all of you. 
most powerful ways that we can impact other people is by sharing with them what God has done for us. Every one of us are here for a reason. And I'm betting that there is something that God has done one way or the other to impact you. And if he hasn't yet, pray for it. And I guarantee you he will. I guarantee you he will. If you really do want it. Just be careful what you ask for. <laughs> he will give it to you. Share that with other people. Let people hear that. You can argue, I know that some people are like, well, I don't want to share my Christianity with other people because I don't know, maybe I won't know how to answer them. They'll, they'll come up with a question that I don't know, like, maybe, you know, why is there evil in the world? And, and if he's such a good God, then what, what? I don't understand how to answer that. I really don't have all the answers. And before I have all the answers, I don't know if I really feel comfortable sharing my faith. Let me tell you this. No one can tell you that you're wrong when you share the simple story of what God has done for you in you. When he says, when you say, this is what he's done for me, they can't say, well, that's a lie. What do you mean it's a lie? That's what happened to me. You asked me what God means. To, why does he mean this to you? What, why is he important to you? Share that with them. That's more powerful than anything else. And people want to hear that. Why do you love God so much? Why do, you, why do you commit yourself to his ways? Why do you go to Sunday? Every Sunday you go to church, you know? I like sleep or something, you know, or I'd rather, I'd rather be watching football on Sundays or golfing. I like golf. God's more important. Why? People want to know why. Share with them. We all have that. Every one of us have that. And that's what people, that's the gem that people are looking for. Truly. For me, I can feel it when people go, why did you leave everything and go into ministry? Why? That's a great story. Powerful story. That's what they want to hear. Because I learned that God was real. That's why. Because I learned that there is a relational aspect that I never knew about and he was saying to me, come and follow me. I have a different path for you. But trust me, it'll be good. Oh, you'll love it. It'll have more life in this than you ever got where you are now. And I'm here to say that is absolutely true. No doubt about it. I find more life here than I have ever found doing anything before. So what are our experiences with Christ and how has he worked in our life? Do we share this with others? Pray for it. Give our hearts to God. Pray for him to help us to have the courage to share our experiences of him with others. Final section. Fellowship and joy, or fellowship with God and joy. This is the purpose. So that we have seen, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This continues the relative clauses, the first four in verse, or section one, verse one. So this is the fifth. That which is seen and heard, so experienced from the first section, and then also we proclaim to you the eternal life was from the last section that we just talked of. So he's combining these two sections together and bringing this to a conclusion. Two purposes. Number one, so that you may have fellowship with us. The purpose is to preserve fellowship. It's always been the point. That's been the whole point of the Bible is fellowship. Fellowship. We lost it in the garden in Genesis 3 when they disobeyed Adam and Eve. And we're getting it back. And God is showing us what is he doing to bring the presence back, the fellowship back. Disciples enjoyed a relationship with God in Jesus every day for three years as a person. And now, since Pentecost, which is coming up in June 8th, mark your calendars, we will be celebrating that day very big. Just as much of Christmas and just as much as, as Easter, Pentecost is one of the three big holidays. Absolutely, it's the birth of the church. So keep into, I'll keep you up to date on what we're going to do for that, but that'll be a lot of fun. Pentecost, the day of the church, 
the birth of the church, the Spirit brought a whole new element to this relationship. And Jesus says, I got to go away so that something even better will come. And it did. John 17, 20 through 23 says, I do not ask for these only. And this is when Jesus was about ready to go to the cross, right? His priestly prayer. He's talking to God. This is what he ends up saying. This is some deep stuff and very, this gives me goosebumps every time I read this stuff because it's so powerful. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And he just got done saying that I gave them your word, Father, and they have accepted it. So he says, through their word now that I've given them, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. I love that. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. That is extremely powerful. We're being pulled in to the Trinity relationship of God. We aren't God, but we are pulled in, welcomed in to the relationship that God has with the Trinity head of being one. And not just with God, but with each other also at the same point. The relationship is to be both with God, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and also with others. And that's a continuing daily thing. Separation is of Satan. What he'll do is he'll always try to divide and envy and jealousy and disagreement and try and separate splits, right, of churches, all of that. That's exactly what Satan wants to do. And he'll do it until he gets us all by ourselves. And then he can tell us whatever he wants. And we're very vulnerable at that place. Holy Spirit and God is the other. He's the opposite. Union, oneness, strength, power, goodness, love. Holy Spirit is the necessary agent to make that possible. Why? Because of sin. Try and have a good fellowship with the church without the Holy Spirit and watch what happens. I guarantee you it will not be anything pretty. You will have people that will be envious of others. You will have arguments, you will have splits, you will have divisions, you will have gossip and talking behind backs and all kinds of stuff that is ugly and nasty. And it happens all the time in the church, unfortunately. John is saying we've been in fellowship with the eternal life, which is God, and we are sharing what we know so that you also can have that fellowship. You can have that relationship with him. So the second purpose is so that our joy may be complete. What basically, what what he's saying here, just to to try and wrap this up quickly, is, is, is this. If we are transformed by the Spirit, if we are being transformed, if we have God living in us, the joy, John can't sit back and watch other people that are supposed to be believers in God be destroyed by deception and by lying and darkness. He can't stand it. His joy, it's not even their joy, he says here, it's his joy that my joy may be complete. Our joy may be complete. If we have the Spirit of God living in us, we cannot sit back and watch injustice and other things of the sort happen if we have the power to do something and be okay with that. It's not possible. We might be able to sidestep it a couple of times, but eventually we'll get a conviction that is so powerful that we just, it'll be like Jeremiah when he says that he had that fire building up inside of him. Even if he didn't want to say something, if he wanted to try and not say what God was telling him to say, he said, I can't do it. I'm going to explode like a volcano. I can't help myself. That's what the Spirit of God does to us, is that he starts to transform us. You know, 
you know the deal. For those of you that have experienced it, I guarantee you that, you, you know, it's like this, where you, things that you had joy in once before, all of a sudden it's just not the same anymore. Things are different. You start thinking about people differently. You actually care about people. Sometimes you're like, I don't even know why I care for them. I just do. That's what he's talking about here. He knows that he has the answer for these people. And it it's killing him that they're being destroyed by deception. So that's why, again, that he's written this letter. For them, that they might have the fellowship that they were always intended to have. This is what, this is basically, this, this is the whole point of the letter, and this is why I chose this letter, is this, is what, what's more important than that, you know, um, than to know God, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people that have asked, why, why do I feel like I'm being defeated all the time if we're supposed to have victory in Christ? We're supposed to be having power and, and joy and love and strength, and yet I feel always just dark and empty and defeated all the time. Um, you can be somebody that has committed your life to Christ, but you're not living in the fullness of what he really has intended for you. That's really what John is saying here is this. You're taking, you're stealing the very power that God is, has for you. So he writes this letter to help them to come back into it and live in his fullness, to embrace what Christianity is really all about. Not saying that you don't go through difficult times as a Christian. In fact, it might even increase, maybe. In my opinion, most of them are probably going to happen regardless whether you're a Christian or not. It's a matter of whether you're going to walk through those problems with God or without him. It's one of the two. I have found life to be much better with God going through those issues than without him. In fact, I can't see how I even got through a lot of stuff without him. So, my question is this. If, I mean, we're not a church if we don't reach out to others and even evangelize. Share the gospel, whether it be the gospel or what God has done with us. Share what he's done for us. You don't have to impose yourself on everybody and, and sharing just the gospel. Tell them about what he's done for you. That's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear something that you've read off of a piece of paper. Pour your heart out to them. What's God done for you? That's what's going to get their attention. How can we sit back and watch people perish when we know that there's something better out there for us, especially if we've experienced it ourselves? And also, how can we be a church if we don't embrace the fellowship ourselves even more? We need to. It was great. We did a few things recently where we got together and dinners and lunches and stuff. It's great. We need to do more. We need to do it more. How can we be individualized and consider ourselves a body and a church? We need to embrace one another. That's, Satan wants to keep us separated as much as possible, keep us as far away from each other as possible, keep communication just as things that we minimally want to reveal. When you get us together, though, and we actually share with each other and can trust one another and not gossip behind each other's back or backstab each other, but actually in love truly embrace one another and help each other through issues of struggle and sin and embrace the Holy Spirit, that's a power that Satan cannot win against. He cannot win. I look forward to our church evolving into that more and more and more. Um, so, do we have that relationship? Do we have the heart for the lost? Have we completely submitted our hearts to God? It's easy to have strayed from that and consider this uh, invitation to come back if that's the case if you're already there good for you then be a, an encouragement to others that maybe have strayed we all will if you haven't now you will i guarantee you at some point in your life then come back come back give a heart to god and watch what he does because that will amaze you guaranteed then your prayers will start doing things I guarantee you. And how can we embrace the fellowship with God and with each other more? So, the proposition is 
that we must know God personally in order to make him known and enjoy the fullness of his fellowship. This is the phrase that you'll find on our website that is the overview. We condensed our mission statement. You'll see it on the bulletin. It is condensed. It's not this paragraph. It's something that's easy to remember a lot more now. You can pretty much, you can memorize it. And I encourage you to do it because it shows you where the heart of our church is. But if you even want to get it even lower than that, even smaller, something really easy, I call it an elevator pitch in sales. What's, what's the quickest thing to explain your church then of where your heart is? You'll see on our website, it's the first thing that pops up. And it says, to know Christ and make him known. To know Christ and make him known. To embrace the fullness of the relationship that God has for us and share that with other people. That's the heart of where we'd like to go forward with. So therefore, that's the heart of this letter as well. So that's what we have in this, in this series. Um, and fellowship is, is the whole key, is the heart of the whole thing, the heart of the matter. Fellowship with God, fellowship with one another as well. In truth, in his spirit, we have God's presence in his fellowship with him, with us, that confirms our authority as well because others will see that and understand you clearly do have God at work in your life. But number two is our fellowship with one another in his likeness also confirms our fellowship with him because we can't do that kind of fellowship without the Holy Spirit. It's just not possible. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. 